the result of what can only be called a chemical nightmare. But not only did the Army conduct these tests, they also filmed many of them. Investigative Reports has obtained much of that film, along with interviews with some of the men who paid the awful consequences. Bad Trip to Edgewood is a story of how the American Army targeted its own people before our Cold War enemy could. Ninety miles north of Washington, D.C., stands Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland. Since World War I, it's been the center of the U.S. Army's research into chemical warfare. Within its laboratories, bizarre experiments take place. By giving a cat LSD, Edgewood Arsenal scientists can turn nature upside down. are always tested before humans. Army scientists want to learn about the dose levels of nerve agents and chemical compounds, what will incapacitate and what will be lethal in an attack, and how American troops can defend themselves under attack. are used as guinea pigs to test the efficiency of gas masks in a chemical explosion. But experiments are not always confined to animals. James Ketchum, a retired army psychiatrist, at Edgewood, his job was to ensure that the bright young soldiers recruited from army bases across America were fit to be medical volunteers. Then he gave them chemical agents and measured their performance. I really don't think it would have been possible to develop this information without using human volunteers. Uh, you cannot generalize from the results in animals to the human. The human is generally much more sensitive to a given dose of a drug than any animal and uh, his ability to do so many things that animals can't do makes it impossible to predict the effects on that kind of behavior from animal work alone. They uh, came around one day and called a formation, you know, everybody getting a group, and they started asking about who would like to go to Maryland to test new uh, gas masks, over-the-counter cough medicine stuff. And I was thinking about it, and I had been doing a lot of guard duty, KP duty, you know. That was really sickening. Well, when they said three-day pass every weekend, no guard duty, no KP, and, and all you had to do with this, I just snatched my hand in the air and volunteered, you know. From my understanding of their presentation, I would be testing riot control gear, uh, stuff like tear gas, uh, riot control gases, and equipment. And uh, I was under, I had no idea that what actually happened to me would have been done to me while there. Some guys stuck their head in a, a sealed, uh, like a cubicle thing, and they sprayed gas in their face. Some, some guys, uh, was operating tanks and stuff, and they sprayed it a cloud. They had to drive through the things.
the testing of humans lasted from 1955 to 1975. 7,000 soldiers were used as guinea pigs. Half were tested with psychochemicals, mind-altering drugs like atropine, scopolamine, and BZ. But the GIs were never told what kind of drugs they were being given or what effects they would have. They told me they was going to give me this injection. I, uh, I questioned it. What is this for? You know? Well, I said, what's in that? What's in that? I want to know what's, what you're giving me. Don't ask questions. This is something that you're told to do. I said, well, what is this going to do to me? Because I was kind of apprehensive. I was getting scared at the time. I said, what if, you know, what are they giving me here? There's nothing wrong with me. I don't need any medication or anything. So, and I asked, well, what's, what's the purpose of this injection? You know, never mind. Don't say nothing. Just do what you're told. Just lay there. And that was all. Several weeks later, on a windy, bitter, cold day, the same volunteer ran the course again. This time, he received a small dose of a chemical compound just before he started his run. The chemical involved was PCP, better known today as the dangerous and illegal angel dust. He felt compelled to disobey his instructions not to touch the platform when he jumped. Although his vision was not impaired, he found it difficult to focus his attention on the next objective. His physical actions were noticeably slower. His motor coordination was disrupted because of the compound's effect. PCP gives the delusion of unnatural strength. How do you feel? I feel pretty good, sir. Do you? Are you cold? Uh, no, I'm not cold at all. Are you tired? No, I'm not tired. Well, I could run. You could do some work, could you? Yes, sir. I could run. I run 100 miles right now. Is that right? You That's feel right. Pretty pepped up, huh? Uh huh. I run through it. And now I feel good, and I'm not tired, and I can run through it again. You see what I mean? Yeah, pardon me, Nicolette. Uh, could Sergeant Ditchkiss give you any uh, instructions about what you were supposed to do tomorrow? Uh, Sergeant Ditchkiss? Uh, uh, yes. Let me see. What was I supposed to do tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow... What, is today Thursday? Today's Thursday, that's right. Today's Thursday, uh-huh. Well, tomorrow... Oh, uh, Wait a minute here. You lost some buttons there. I lost some buttons here. Soon the Army decides to test the soldiers with other stronger drugs, including LSD. That what investigative reports returns here on A&E. The volunteers received doses of a secret compound called BZ. A small dose would lead to complete stupor for three days, followed by loss of memory. The Army wanted to see how quickly different doses could incapacitate their fittest and most intelligent soldiers. And between 1955 and 1967, Edgewood Arsenal was responsible for testing 740 soldiers and 900 civilians with one of the most powerful drugs known to man, the hallucinogen LSD. People in my field were well aware that LSD was a potent drug, that it could cause deviant responses, that people could do uh, dangerous things to themselves and others act impetuously and so forth um, and so we had to think about that a great deal 
Um, I didn't want to do any studies with LSD until we had a secure environment. And when we had a secure environment, by which I mean a fully padded room, a nursing staff around the clock, and when we had developed screening to the point that we could, we thought, identify individuals who were at risk for having a psychotic response to LSD, uh, then we tentatively and cautiously began to give small doses. Two hours later, the squad, all except the drill sergeant, now drugged with LSD, again was ordered to fall in. The response was not the same. Notice the volunteer who salutes several times. Five minutes later, his severe depression caused the medical officers to end his participation in the test. But in marching, the drug squad, although starting fairly well, gave a sluggish and ragged performance. After a few minutes, the men found it difficult to obey orders. And soon, the results were chaotic. There was much laughter as the group attempted to give expression to inner emotions. This elation was group supported, and an individual who was separated from the group would show severe disturbance. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> What's going on? I was <laughs> Volunteers were given doses of LSD between three and ten times higher than the normal acid trip. Army records show in one case, a man received a dose 100 times higher. I, will, I laughed for, uh, seems like, hours on end. I laughed and laughed and laughed until I couldn't hold my, hold my sides any longer. Uh, my sides were sore from laughter. It's like looking upwards and seeing spirals of glittering colors coming down, uh, unwinding, uh, vivid colors, different colors, uh, colors that, that are, are really indescribable. I, I don't know, never seen colors like that. You subtract 7 from 98, please. 90, 91. All right, and continue. He's having a reaction that's a little different from the ordinary, where most of the effects are bodily sensations. And in fact, he made the comment, uh, I feel incapacitated. I think he must have been reading the brochure or something in advance. But uh, this was a librarian and a very intelligent guy. And uh, it's interesting that he put most of the emphasis on the bodily symptoms. Is your vision been affected? Oh, yes, definitely. How has it been affected? I can't distinguish colors. You can't distinguish colors? No. What color is this? I had this terrific headache. Right. The, the most terrific headache I've ever had in my life is like my head was going to split in half. And it lasted for hours. It just, just, the, just aching, splitting. Uh, and uh, it, nothing se seemed to matter but just getting rid of that headache at that particular time. Yeah, I can remember at the time thinking that somebody had a band of, of iron around my head and was just continuing to squeeze it, continuing to twist it in. It, it, was, it was, you know, as I say, the worst headache I've ever had. We started to have hysteria because of the uh, fly on the wall. Well, he started to be gigantic and, uh, and it scared scared me actually to where it uh, you didn't know what to do he was frightened of it but there was nothing you could do about it it seemed like I couldn't uh, couldn't move to defend myself or nothing because of the uh, experience I was experiencing um, it was really a uh, bad situation and I knew it at the time but there's nothing I could do about it. 
I was totally incapacitated, totally incapacitated. I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't move anything. It was, everything was slowing down. I couldn't, I had no function of my body. I couldn't hardly write, you know. They give me them, like I said, they give me them math problems again. I couldn't hardly write. I couldn't hold my arm up. I started seeing giant spiders that appeared to be about two or three feet in size all over the walls. And I, I was, I'm n not normally scared of spiders, but I mean, the size just, just, just blew me away. I could not believe they were in there. And it, it, it frightened me that these things were so big and there were so many of them in a little room. And I started seeing boils on my body and blisters. And then they hooked up an uh, electrocephalogram and had all the little wires in my head with the little clay and, and whatever. And they were measuring and they were asking, I was laying in this totally dark room on this bed with this strobe light over my head in the dark room and, and this machine, I could hear this machine just grinding and running. And then they would ask you questions and then when you would answer the question, they would want you to put your teeth together to short the machine out. And so they, they would ask, they would go, that's when they would ask, you know, do you, does your hand or your feet feel like it's no longer part of your body? And then they would turn the strobe light on and that thing would start flashing real slow and then it would go faster and faster. And pretty soon, all you would see is two giant pinwheels, just colored, multicolored wheels on the ceiling going in opposite directions. And then the whole bed is floating. I became really frightened because the, the instructor was holding something in his hand and I could not understand what it was. I was told later it was a gas mask, but I thought it was the head of the battalion commander. I thought he was holding this thing up and it was a battalion commander's head. An army doctor came in and wanted to check me and the reason I know he's an army doctor, I saw his captain bars on his shoulder. And I kept wanting him to come over to the bed because I wanted to kill him. I never knew the individual. And I just begged him to come over to the bed. Because all I wanted to do was just, just kill him. So I reached over to grab the wash pan to throw at him and just bolted down. And I really came violent then. And I couldn't get the wash pan to move. And I couldn't get the nice stand to move. Everything was bolted down. Do you know Reaper, what Reaper, Reaper, Reaper! Do you know what day it is today, Cap? Yeah. What? Call him, call him. What day of the week? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't okay. bug me. What the hell are you used to the anyway? I'm going, I'm going back so far, so many faces in the... Basically, they're really crawling. What day is it? I can't remember a thing. I can't remember. Come on, man. I don't want this stuff. I could not control my mind. I could not think on anything. My mind was just like being out of my head. And I didn't have a mind. Uh, I lost all time. I didn't know if it was daylight or dark. Uh, things started to, uh, to get very, very bad. And I went back, started going back in time. I remember uh, instances of just flashes of uh, different, different things that I had done in my life. And all at once, everything was black. It was plum black. Uh, I heard a gush of water. And uh, I come out, actually reborn again, is what I figure. When I come out the second time when I was, this was a terrible uh, situation. But after I was being reborn, heard the water, I come out, I was curled all up and crying. And... Uh, Things started gradually coming up, coming back. Slowly and slowly, but surely it was coming back. The drug is starting to wear off at this time, I think. And it took quite a while for that to happen. I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of that this was it. This was, there was something going to happen. I wasn't going to live through this. You know, it was a, uh, Real scary. That was the scariest part. And I don't remember how long it was like that. I don't remember waking up. I don't remember. I was ordered not to tell anybody about any of the procedures they used or what happened when I left there. They didn't tell me at first when I came.
But when I was getting ready to leave, they ordered me not to tell anybody, don't divulge any information about what went on here, who was here, or what was going on. That's what I was told, I was under orders. We didn't, we couldn't speak about it. We couldn't tell a doctor, we was told not to tell anyone, anyone, not to explain anything or any to anyone at the time. So we didn't, you know. The volunteers kept their secrets. They left the Army's testing centers with no warning about the after effects of the drugs and compounds they received. When Bad Trip to Edgewood returns, the Army decides to take some of its testing out of the labs and into the cities. For some, it will be a fatal decision. In the heart of New York, Operation Big City was underway. A Ford Mercury, specially adapted with a hidden exhaust pipe, pumped out bacteria onto the streets of Manhattan. Undercover agents entered the city's subway system. Their cases equipped with tiny motors, which covertly dispersed the bacteria Bacillus globuli. Ten years later, the army returned. Light bulbs filled with bacteria were dropped in front of trains and down ventilation shafts to test how far the bacteria would spread through the subway system. For years, these public experiments were kept secret from the citizens of New York. faithfully filmed its own experiments. This Washington, D.C. bus station was the site of another secret test. Thirty similar trials were conducted at public locations all across America. One of the earliest experiments had fatal consequences. In 1951, the army sprayed the bacteria Sorosha marsisums over San Francisco. Eleven hospital patients developed a mysterious infection. And within days, Edward Nevin died from an illness caused by the same bacteria. In 1953, CIA employee Frank Olson leaped through his bedroom window on the 10th floor of this New York hotel. Nine days earlier, a fellow CIA scientist had secretly spiked his drink with LSD. It took the government 22 years to acknowledge its role in Frank Olson's death. Another cover-up concerned the death of a civilian, Harold Blower. Suffering from depression, he was a patient at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. There, he and five other patients were unwittingly tested with mind-altering drugs by doctors who'd signed a secret contract with the U.S. Army. Again, it was more than 20 years before his family discovered the truth. In 1975, I was living in California with my two children. There was a knock on the door, and two people in uniform were at the door. They said they were from the Pentagon, and they wanted to talk to me about the death of my father. And I told them that um, my father had been dead a long time, they came in and they told me that they had found papers at the Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. And these papers had information about my father's death. It took Harold Blower's family 15 years of fighting the government in court before a judge's ruling established the facts. On January 8th, 1953, between 9.53 and 9.57 a.m., 
My father was injected with 450 milligrams or 6.47 milligrams kilograms of body weight of EA1298. According to the drug study notes, at 9.57, my father became very restless and had to be restrained by the nurse. He began sweating profusely and flailing his arms wildly. At 10.01, he pulled up in bed, his body stiffened, his teeth clenched, and he began frothing at the mouth. Similar reactions continued for over an hour. My father was still talking and moving his legs randomly at 11.05. Finally, at about one and a half hours after the injection had begun, my father lapsed into a coma. He was pronounced dead at 12.15 p.m. What do you think when you read that? I think they murdered him. They had a drug to test and that's all I cared about. They didn't care whether he lived or died. All I wanted to know was the results of this particular drug. And they took his life. And they made him suffer. They made him suffer terribly. Not only before the injection with his fear and his, his not wanting to have it, but his death must have been just awful. And there was no need for any of that. There's no question but that he was a human guinea pig for the testing up by the, uh, the Army Chemical Corps. He did not know what the purpose of these was. He was never asked uh, to participate, and he didn't give his consent to be a human guinea pig. The doctor who actually injected the chemical, uh, the lethal injection, into Mr. Blower, when asked in 1975 by one of the Army Inspector Generals, uh, what this was. He said, and, and this, was, this came out during the course of the trial, he told the Inspector General under oath, he said, we didn't know whether it was dog piss. And that's the shocking thing, that this doctor would inject this chemical into a patient of his without knowing what it was. Belinda Blower and her sister finally won three quarters of a million dollars in compensation. But they could not sue the doctors who had given their father the mescaline derivative drugs. Instead, the court awarded damages because of the negligent manner in which the U.S. Army scientists had tested the drugs on mice before they were given to Harold Blower. As a result of the Olson and Blower scandals, the U.S. Congress now focused on the stories emerging from Edgewood Arsenal. One of the first to testify was Bill Jordan. O'clock in the morning, something like that. We were given about 150 micrograms of LSD-25 in distilled water. And within a period of about 20 minutes, the effects began to take place, uh, principally initially nausea, um, vertigo, and then uh, spatial disorientation and complete disintegration of, uh, of everything around us. The 1975 hearings led Congress to tighten the regulations governing human testing during medical research. I think when the concern was raised in problems seen with a testing program uh, that while it tried to look at the greater good, clearly uh, did not do what many felt, and, and I agree, was uh, the right thing for the individual, restrictions were put in place. Uh, I think uh, individuals were used as, uh, as uh, test subjects uh, without being fully aware of, uh, of what they were doing, what they were being given. Uh, I think most volunteered um, recognizing that they'd be involved in something, but I think uh, they had a right, and certainly today have a right to know exactly what it is that they're being exposed to and what the risks are, and that's what we try to provide. Congress now will focus its investigation on what happened to the volunteers at Edgewood when Investigative Reports returns here on A&E. Term physical risk. The surveys had given the Edgewood tests a clean bill of health. But the Army's own study revealed one disturbing and forgotten statistic. 24% of the volunteers re-examined had reported long-term adverse effects. Not physical, but psychological.
two weeks after I left Edgewood uh, is when the flashback started. And they have lasted now for 20 years until I finally got some medication to help me control it. It don't never stop in your mind, but the medications keep you from being terrified over it. And uh, this is the way I've lived all these years. So I thought I was going plum crazy. And uh, I was afraid of that too. I, I didn't know what to do. And I, I lived with it until I got out of service in 1959. I came home and, and tried to work. I could not hold work, could not hold a job. My mind just wouldn't function. One day in particular, there in my unit, I had went to the arms room where we kept our weapons, withdrew my 45 caliber pistol, went into the barracks, totally disassembled it, and was having an, an, a class, beautiful class, except I was the only one there. The battalion executive also walked in and wanted to know what was going on, and I told him I was giving a class. Well, he just immediately walked out, you know, and I realized that I was the only one there, and I reassembled the pistol and turned it back in. Jim, why didn't you go and get some help from somebody? You must have thought something was going wrong. What was going through your mind, and why didn't you get any help? I knew that I was having a problem. But in those days, in the early 50s, if I would have went to the Army doctors and said, Doc, I have a problem. I go places, but I can't get there. I, I see things that isn't there. I do things that's out of the ordinary for a human being. What is my problem? He would have said, you're crazy. You have a psycho problem. We don't need psycho problems in the Army. Goodbye. Then I would have been out the door with a wife and five or six children with no place to go. So I hid my problem. I cried in my own corner. Any symptoms for fear that I really was losing it. And shortly thereafter, I had a grand mal seizure. And for the next 30 years, I was an epileptic. And I had grand mal and petty mal and psychomotor seizures. on tons of different medication and nothing stopped them. I kept having them. And I was struggling at the same time to raise a family, to stay in the army, and to keep my head on straight. I think uh, probably more of them would have volunteered if they <laughs> knew what was going to happen to them. A lot of them regarded this experience as a, a very interesting adventure. Um, and in fact, we had a number of them volunteer to repeat the experience. We did do some studies where we gave the same drug on two occasions, say uh, separated by a couple of weeks, uh, or two different drugs. Some individuals received BZ once and then maybe a couple weeks later might get a dose of LSD. I've had uh, diabetes, a uh, nervous breakdown, uh, and uh, I, 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 had a, I was a complete vegetable for almost like two years between uh, 82 and 84. That had to be uh, something that in the, in, the, in the interim between the time that I went into the service and the time that I came out, 
that uh, that changed me. I don't I don't know I don't know whether it was the serv the military itself or whether it was going to Edgewood. I I can't say whether it was or not, but there was a change in me. Uh, in my in my uh, total outlook on life and uh, the way that I uh, viewed uh, my future. My personality had just changed. My mother had made numerous statements that I wasn't the same person I was prior to the test. or prior, Well, she didn't know what it was, but prior to my trip to Edgewood. And I went from being a pretty much passive person to being an aggressive person. I would lose a hair trigger temper, and it would just be over piddly things. I mean, you and I might be sitting here talking, and it just all of a sudden, one word would come out wrong, or something, one, a ch child might drop something, I'd just lose my temper, and just literally, I've, I've thrown plates, I've put my wife through a wall, through the, through the sheetrock wall when I've lost my temper, and thank God she wasn't hurt. But we, we were sitting there talking, and the next thing, I, lo I lost my temper, and I reached, and I wanted to just have her quiet, and I grabbed her by her shoulders and went back with her, and she went through the sheetrock on the wall. And it scared the life out of me, and I've, I've had violent episodes with my children, with my wife, and with people I work with. And it's over little things, nothing significant. Because of the secrecy involved that we were told from Edgewood Arsenal not to discuss, my wife didn't know about this until 1980. And this was a period of seven years of our married life that she had no knowledge of what was going on with me. It was just a total loss to her why I would become violent and break into rages, you know. And whenever I'd have a seizure, she couldn't understand why. It makes me sad because I've lost a lot of my family. Uh, my closeness with my family, my brothers, my mother till she died, it was all, it was more of a, I'll see you once a year and, and I can't see you any more than that because I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And with my daughters and my wife, I can't get close to them like I want to. I can't hold my daughter and hug her. I can't tell her I love her. It's a, something inside has just changed. It's just eating at me and eating at me and it's torn at them. Next, the medical volunteers of Edgewood state their most bitter feeling. Why weren't we warned when we return here on A&E? Be it endless fascination with the Bible or chilling tales of gothic horror, man has been compelled by the wonders of the unknown since the beginning of time. From the possible existence of Bigfoot to the grip of a mummy's curse, these are the stories that myths and legends are made of. Uncover the truth behind ancient mysteries. Next on a &E, it's time well spent. If they had told somebody, said, hey, we use this individual for LSD, he may be a little, a little flaky now and then. He may lose his bearings, but cuddle him, take him to the medical people, and talk to him, counsel him. But, you know, just don't throw him into the, to, to the ditch and, you know, let him go. Because it was so hard on my family. We you know when I, when I got back, they didn't understand what was going on. My parents didn't understand. My, even my c close friends, they, they didn't understand. You know, they said, you know, he's gone. He's really, really out of it, you know. What's wrong with him? Did he get hit in the head? Did he got shell-shocked? But if they had just, just told somebody, you know, and patted me on the head and said, boy, you did a good job, you know, but now you're a little sick. The people were not informed. They were not fully informed of what the hazards were, what the dangers were, how unstable LSD was, and how each individual can have separate reactions to the same dosage. And of course that there was no follow-up. It was like, hey, you know, no big deal. Just trot along on your way. 
Uh, we did not warn volunteers that they were likely to have flashbacks or suicidal ideation or any of the uh, uh, number of bad things that can happen to people, uh, whether they're correctly or incorrectly attributed to having LSD on one uh, occasion. Uh, the reason we did not is the same reason that doctors don't advise patients uh, of the likelihood of having something when there's a less than 1% chance of its occurring. After 24 hours rest, the completely recovered volunteers reviewed their experience. What was this business over here in the corner? Are you lying down and uh, looking at the wall? Well, the... I didn't think it was good psychology to say to these volunteers, by the way, you may have a terrible flashback sometime in the next year or two, or you may feel like committing suicide or jumping off a high building. I don't think many doctors would put that, plant that thought in the head of a, of a patient or, or a volunteer. N no, no one ever told me from Edgewood that there would be any after effects or any, any, anything from the, the uh, testing that was done there. What do you think about that now, looking back on it? I feel very disappointed that uh, my country would uh, do something like that to me and not inform me of uh, potential dangers. It tugs at my patriotism. They had no follow-up on it. No doctor saw me. And, like I say, for over 20-some years, they just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't tell me what they give us so we could be treated for it. I had to sue the government to find out what drugs they give me. And when I got into the lawsuit, they finally admitted that they did give me an overdose of LSD. But Calvin Sweet received no damages because the government has immunity from being sued by its own servicemen. James Stanley also sought damages and lost. Dissenting Supreme Court judges compared the Edgewood tests to the Nazi experiments of World War II. I never did receive any apology from any government official in either by word of mouth, by telephone, or by written letter. Nothing. They didn't say, thank you, Jim Stanley. You did a good job. You poor, stupid individual. We used you. Now we're finished with you. We didn't. They didn't thank me at all. Not one thank you. You know, even, even an, an old shoe, you, you know, when you throw it aside, you know, you say, God, you was a good old shoe. I hate to throw you away. But not Jim Stanley, not the rest of the individuals that took that test. They didn't say thank you at all. James Stanley was once the youngest master sergeant in the U.S. Army. He has spent the last four years fighting to have a private compensation bill approved by Congress. It has passed the House. And if okayed by the Senate, most likely many more human guinea pigs will come forward to claim damages for their long nightmare on their bad trip to Edgewood. I don't respect my government the way I should. I don't respect the people that are supposed to run it. I don't respect the army. One, one, I gave seven years of my life on active duty, then went to the National Guard for seven more years. I gave 14 years of my life to this army. I could have been killed in Vietnam, I, but I was killed here by Edgewood Arsenal as far as my family, as far as me. I was killed here. I don't have a heart because of it, because I can't touch my kids, and I can't tell my wife what I feel. I would, I would say that People aren't to be guinea pigs. People have brains, they have emotions, they have feelings. These things aren't to be experimented with people. You can't take a man's mind from him. You can't take his emotions from him. It's, it, you just can't take these things from a human being. And that's what they did. They just, they just alienated ourselves, our mind, I guess, from our bodies. They wanted to control our minds or see what they could do to our minds and then just left us. And most of us that I've seen are shells of what we were. We want to be what we were. 
not what we are. Edgewood was not the first time the American military tested the effects of chemicals on its own men. In World War II, 60,000 soldiers were secretly given various exposures to mustard gas, a blister-producing gas. This secret testing was conducted in order to develop better protective clothing, masks, and skin ointments. It's now been determined that 4,000 of those men received what's called significant exposure to the gas. In just the past year, nearly 50 years later, the U.S. government finally agreed to compensate those 4,000 former servicemen. With that in mind, it could be a very long time before the last chapter is written in a bad trip to Edgewood. I'm Bill Curtis. Join us next time for another edition of Investigative Reports here on A&E. Filmed on three continents, Walter Cronkite takes us on an incredible evolutionary journey. Don't miss Ape Man, Sunday. Now join us for Ancient Mysteries, next on A&E. How do you feel? I feel pretty good, sir. Do you? Are you cold? Uh, no, I'm not cold at all. Are you tired? No, I'm not tired. Well, I could run. Could do some I, work, could you? Yes, sir. I could run. I run 100 miles. From research to find cures for tobacco-related diseases by teaching children the dangers of smoking with medical care for people who cannot afford to pay themselves. Maybe 25 cents doesn't seem like much, but if a 25 cent tax on every pack of cigarettes saves one life, your yes vote on 99 will be worth a lot. Name after name, panel after panel, the Names Project Quilt, a memorial to those who have died of AIDS, traveled 12,000 miles bringing a nation face to face with a deadly disease. From coast to coast, in cities and towns, follow this historic journey of hope as Americans remember friends, relatives, and lives lost to AIDS. Remember my name, an AIDS Lifeline special. Sunday at 8 on Channel 5. West 57, could you wait a minute, please? This is one of the most prominent ranching families in, in Montana. They're trying to come to terms with how they managed to end up in jail for growing marijuana. We have found a uh, farm publication that we picked up someplace. It said, uh, marijuana, the saver of the family farm. My, uh, my grandfather came to that ranch. And so I didn't want to lose it. I need more on that. Let's bring it up a bit. Good, there you go. Stand by and try it again. When you go in a store, you can go into an adult pornography store. And although it's very hard, there are code words. There, are, There's a way to let the guy know behind the desk that what you really want is kitty porn. They are like to a pedophile. They are like uh, merit badges to a Boy Scout. There's something that you cherish. Black. One. It's all about Mike. You him. It's a great American tradition to be the reluctant hero. You know, it goes back to Bogey. Uh, Bogey in Casablanca didn't really want to get involved, but he's such an innate hero that he had to. And that's, that's the kind of guy that Clint Eastwood is, in a way. Take it. Welcome to West 57. I'm Steve Croft. Every now and then, major issues have a way of intersecting at a certain place in a certain time to produce a news story that might have leapt from the computer terminal of a Hollywood screenwriter. Our first story of the new season is a bit like that. The issues are drought, hard times on the farm, and the easy money of the drug culture. The place is the American West. The characters, a prominent close-knit family. The gambit, 
a brief excursion to the wrong side of the law. It seemed easy. Uh, we felt that we were the right age uh, to not be suspect. We'd never had any, any of our family had ever had any kind of criminal record, not one. By 1985, Dick Kurth, like many American farmers and ranchers, was growing desperate. Boy, there's nothing left, is there? Two years of drought and low grain prices had left him and his wife, Judy, nearly $2 million in debt and facing foreclosure. We um, were sitting in front of our bank officer and saying, what can we do? Uh, he said, um, short of growing marijuana, I don't know what you can do. Why don't you try that? Do you think he was kidding? We uh, took it as such, yeah, but then, you know, the idea kind of gets to you. We also found a uh, farm publication that we picked up someplace. I can't find it. I wish I had it. But it said, uh, marijuana, the savor of the family farm. I said, I think somebody is trying to tell us something. It's difficult to imagine two more unlikely drug suppliers than Dick and Judy Kurt. After all, he had been a Republican state committeeman, conservation rancher of the year, an appointee of the governor, and member of the local school board. She had once been runner-up for Mrs. Montana. What was it, really, that got you to, to do this? It was the money. It was that strong uh, driving force? My, uh, my grandfather came to that ranch, and so I didn't want to lose it. In their own minds, if they were going to give the ranch to their grandchildren, there was now only one way out. So they made a plan and decided to take the risk. We ran it as hard and fast as we could because we had it in our mind that we were going to do it for two years and we were going to be out of it. Life in the drug underworld began, Dick Kurth says, in a Great Falls bar where he made some careful inquiries and eventually a connection. A local dealer supplied him with a few marijuana plants and a book on how to grow it. His 6,000 acre ranch seemed the perfect place to do it. The type of a place we've got uh, lent to the use of lots of electricity so we weren't suspect for the use of a lot of electricity for lighting to grow the plants indoors. Our closest neighbor uh, was uh, eight miles to the east and three miles to the south and so on. Uh, we're in, out uh, in the wilds of Montana. We weren't, uh, and I was a pillar of the community. People weren't looking at me for doing such things. You thought you had it figured out? I thought I had it figured out. They concealed their growing and drying operation in the rafters of a barn and in three other buildings on the property. They installed grow lights and an intricate fertilization system that any county agent would have been proud of. We just learned by, by hit or miss on a lot of it, and we just developed a good system of doing it. And I'm not trying to be proud of that. I'm just telling you how it, how it happened. You're a fairly meticulous person. I like to do a good job. If I'm going to do that, I did that well, too. Right. Good product? Well, everyone said it was excellent. <laughs> At first, the Kurths hid their operation from their family. But the business grew so quickly, they needed help. So they turned to the only workforce they could trust, their own children. When your parents tell you they're growing marijuana. What do you tell them? What do you say? <laughs> we said we, we, say we had to give a little thought. I mean, we're, we're talking about two people that are pretty straight, or what we thought were pretty straight, if, that's, if there's a straight and narrow. Why? I don't know. It was a total shock. Why on earth did you ever decide to get involved in this? I guess it just goes back to a great devotion to family. If if that's if that's a crime, I'm I'm uh, in trouble for it. Well, you knew it was illegal, and you were worried about getting caught. Did you think it was wrong? Yes. Oh yes. We all believed it was wrong. You, you ended up hating yourself for what you were doing. What about the money? Did you get money out of it? We didn't. We didn't. No. no. The whole idea of doing it was to put the money back into the bank. And that's where it went, totally, it to the bank. But getting money into the bank would not be easy without raising suspicions. So Dick Kurth claims he went back to his friends at the Norwest Bank and told them exactly what was going on. When you told the banker that you were 
growing marijuana? What was his reaction? He said, well, that's good. Maybe that'll work. That surprised you, that reaction? Well, I guess not, because it's, he gave us that idea, so I guess I just felt like, well, I guess he really meant that. Then what happened? When we did have cash, I went to him and said, all right, now how do we get it in there? And that's when he explained how to bring the money in and what increments to bring the money in and how to get the money into the bank, the cash into the bank. Under federal law, banks must report cash deposits of $10,000 or more to the IRS to discourage money laundering. According to Dick Kurth, a Norwest vice president told him that the bank had its own internal controls and to keep his deposits under $3,000. What was the bank's attitude towards this whole operation and enterprise? Was there a time at which... Uh, oh, they took the money. They know where it came from? I'm sure they did. Since they explained so many times how to get it in there. He said, no problem. He said, you just come in and deposit uh, $2,940 to the outside teller with your car, and you come in and at the same time come inside and put another one deposit like that in into the teller at the window inside the bank and maybe later that afternoon put in another one and I've got bank records that prove that's what I did they knew it was for marijuana oh, yes absolutely they did and the Kurtz have no witnesses to back up their story about the bank only their bank statement showing multiple deposits on certain days and the results of a lie detector test the Norwest Bank which declined an interview denies it all calling the Kurtz accusations preposterous and a complete fabrication but whether they're true or whether they're false had no bearing on the Kurtz's own downfall. That was precipitated by their colleagues in crime, part of a fast and dangerous crowd they were now doing business with. When did you first see them? Well, they were coming down the hill, Steve, and it was 7.30 at night, so it was dark. Last October 16th, five armed men forced their way onto the Kurth ranch. And they, hand, they put me up against the vehicle. They have guns? Yep, he had a revolver and the other guy had a, a uh, shotgun. And he flashed this badge like this, but it was dark. And he said, we're DEA agents and we've had you under surveillance for a year. But they were not drug agents. They were extortionists who terrorized members of the Kurth family, demanding $25,000 or they would call the police. The Kurths refused to pay. Did you ever think uh, when you first decided to get into this business, that maybe you might run into some people that might not be so nice? No, we really didn't think of that. No. It's fairly naive. In it is pretty isn't? naive. But you want to remember, we were pretty damn naive. You know, when I was 57 years old, I'm going to start in a pot business. I didn't know anything about it. Absolutely not at all. I've seen it on television. That's as far as I ever was exposed. Only one of the extortionists has been caught. Law enforcement officials think he may have been connected to a rival drug gang. In any event, Authorities were tipped off, and when the DEA and Choteau County Sheriff Paul Williams descended, this is what they found. A very large operation, very sophisticated, very well planned. One of the largest grow operations that we know of in the Northwest, inside grow operation, that is. There were more than 2,000 plants, gallons of hash tar oil, and more than $50,000 worth of growing and processing equipment. Seven members of the Kurth family were arrested. I was relieved. I was frightened, but I was relieved. I really was that the whole thing was over now. And um, at least we knew that they were real police officers, not someone who was there to attack us. Because I still have nightmares of all five of my kids being dead. And uh, so, I, I mean, nothing is worth it. Nothing. News of the arrest stunned the nearby community of Fort Benton. If the Kurths had expected sympathy or at least understanding from their neighbors, they were greeted instead with outrage and ostracism. I was terribly, terribly disappointed in them that they could stoop to this. I mean, we could all use a little more money, but not any of us except the Kurths would stoop to that. They've uh, brought a cr criminal element into this county, like the people that worked them over for the money. What would happen, say, if our kids were staying with their kids when this took place? We could have had children injured or anything else. This is the danger that, that they've exposed this whole community to that I don't like. The people in town think that you let them down, that there's a moral failing here somewhere, that you exposed the community to dangerous people, that you exposed 
their children to what they consider to be dangerous drugs. We made an effort not to have that product in that community. Uh, we also made an effort uh, that we, we burned all of the leaves and, and the, what, what everyone would call trash that had a lot of value. We burned it because we wanted what we, a product that, that, the, that the people we supplied called uh, uh, lawyer bud. It went to the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants and the people that had the money. It was expensive. And, and we, we went that way and destroyed that other part because we didn't want it sold on the street corner to the kids. Did you feel guilty while all this was happening? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. that was a, uh, it was a, an awful pull between the guilt that you knew that what was happening and what you were doing every day and then you would go to your grandchildren's basketball games that night and yeah there was a guilt this isn't a little case of shopping i mean when they did it they did a biggie and i mean this is a horrible crime affected a lot of lives probably ruined a lot of lives and i think they should be punished all yeah. of them people here were outraged not only by what the kurths did but also by the leniency of the sentences they received the seven members of the Kurth family were allowed to plea bargain to felony drug possession charges with intent to sell. But only Dick and Judy Kurth would actually go to jail. Okay. Did you give Grandpa a big hug? You bet. Okay, sweetheart. Don't ever forget I love you. Their grown children all received suspended sentences from Montana Court Judge Chan Eddian. It struck me as something of an American tragedy, which it is. Uh, here's a man who, uh, as fine a life as could have been led right up to that point where their ranch and farm operation was going down the drain. And in desperation, he went, he went that route. Dick Kurth received four 20-year concurrent prison terms, but 15 years were suspended, which means he'll be eligible for parole in just 18 months. Judy Kurth was sentenced to five years in state prison, but four years were suspended. She could be out in three months. The standing they've had in that community is red. They're self-confessed felons, and, and that stigma is going to be on them for many, many years, probably. And I felt basically that that in itself was, was a, something of a punishment. You said that marijuana is somewhat of a soft drug, not as serious as cocaine or uh, crack right. or heroin. Right. What are your thoughts on marijuana? It, it doesn't cause, it's not the social evil that uh, crack or, or cocaine or heroin or even uh, alcohol is. Have you ever smoked it yourself? Years and years ago I tried it, a uh, couple, three joints, and uh, it didn't do anything, so that was the end of that. I can't condone what those folks did because I've seen the results of those drugs and what they have done to people. You think they're a menace to society here in Fort Benton? They broke the law. They got caught. Uh, the, I think where we fell down was in our judicial system. I, I go back to the Depression years, and there was uh, reports made of, of individual ranch, some ranchers who saved the old homestead by making and selling moonshine. Well, now, this, uh, with the curse situation, is parallel, but of course it's on a larger scale. Beyond their jail terms, the Kurths still face financial ruin. The state of Montana is trying to collect three quarters of a million dollars in drug taxes, and the Norwest Bank is still threatening to foreclose on the ranch. Did you really believe that you could go into the marijuana business and pay off nearly two million dollars worth of debts uh, without getting into the bind that you're in now? Uh, we could have stayed at it in two years, we could have. Yeah, we could have. If you hadn't gotten caught. We hadn't gotten caught. Do you think that, um, that there's a lesson in this for people? What is it? I don't think that probably, um, possessions are that much, you know, they don't amount to that much material things. I, um, now even wonder whether our land was worth it. Coming up on West 57, Clint Eastwood from Rawhide to Dirty Harry. <laughs> 